So I want to welcome all of you who are here joining us live for our academic update this spring and anybody who's watching the recording as well. Um, my name is Jordan Williams. Uh, you all, I think, know me, but in case anybody watching this doesn't, um, that's who I am. And we are recording this session, as I just mentioned. And so the way we'll handle questions is you'll be able to unmute yourself um, at any time if you'd like to interject. Um, if you prefer not to be on the recording, you can also use the chat feature. We'll make sure to monitor that as well. And uh, without further ado, I'll do a formal introduction for uh, Dr. Ruth Ann Thompson, who is the Executive Director for CLEAR, which she's going to be talking to us about today. But I think as she just went through a little bit, she's also an Associate Professor with the Department of Biological Sciences, and I believe also the Co-Director of Teach North Texas and Assistant Vice President for Digital Strategy and Innovation. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Jordan. I appreciate it. Uh, is it still morning? It is still morning. It's been a long day already. Um, but thanks for uh, letting me come on and talk about the new division of uh, digital strategy and innovation at UNT. Um, it, it's really exciting. About two and a half years ago, uh, Dr. Adam Fine came from Illinois and uh, this new uh, division was created. Adam is the vice president who sits on the president's cabinet, uh, which is really, really helpful um, because then we're able to be more involved in, in offering um, some solutions to, to academic needs, whereas before uh, we didn't really have that opportunity so much. So I think it's really been a, a fantastic move. In light of the pandemic, it was almost prescient um, you know, to have this kind of system. So. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share screen. Everything that I'm gonna share with you today is on our website. So if at any time you would like to, uh, you know, take a look at that or refresh, or if you have any questions, um, you can, you know, head to our website. So I'm gonna share screen. Uh, if I find it, here we go. All right, can everybody see that okay? I'm sorry, so many people are muted. I wanna make sure that, uh... okay, thumbs up, thank you. Okay, so this is the Division of Digital Strategy and Innovation and CLEAR is now under this division, okay? And CLEAR at one point was CDL and before that it was something else, but it is the online instruction arm of the university. Um, so Adam is the vice president. I'm one of the assistant vice presidents and I'm the assistant vice president uh, for DSI. Um, and then we have my uh, department, which is DSI Clear. And this is Clear is pretty much the same unit that it was before, um, though we've made a lot of adaptations. But you know, if you remember the CDL type unit or the, the uh, CLEAR unit, it's just changed its, uh, the acronym is the same, but our name has changed. And uh, you can see we've gotten a lot bigger. Um, also under digital strategy and innovation, we have DSI growth, and this is the marketing arm for online education. We also have uh, uh, our, our budget officer. We have another team called DSI Enterprise. Um, this is a team that works with partners that are external to UNT. So for instance, we have a partnership with Coursera that I'll tell you about uh, here in a little bit. And so she's the, the project manager over that. Um, we also have a DSI learning research team. And uh, so one of the things that Adam and I agreed on, we met for coffee when he was inviting me to the position that I was not wanting to take. Um, but he brought up that we're not going to put forward anything that doesn't have research to support it. And that, that sunk me because, um, you know, like many of you know, uh, being in the sciences, uh, research is, is real, it really important to me. And so that one, that was the selling, selling point. Um, and then we also have DSI Tech, which you also uh, probably remember as classroom support. Okay. So once when DSI or once when CLEAR was all by itself as a unit, now it is a, a member of a larger uh, division with multiple departments inside of it. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. So what I wanna do now is I wanna show you our eight commitments. And this is um, what, what Adam and I worked on um, in order to uh, 
show everybody what it is that we plan on doing with this division. Okay, so these are our eight commitments, um, and these are the this is the streamlined version of it. We want to make sure that there is an inclusive environment, and the way that we do that is. Uh, so Dr. Thompson, sorry yes. to interrupt, but I did have a couple of messages about um, your volume. I don't Are you able to turn the volume on your microphone up a little bit? Uh, let me see. Or maybe move it a little closer. Yeah, I think I'm just too far away. Okay. All right. Is that any better? I think so. Yeah, okay. and we can turn the volume up on our end too, so. Okay, and I can use my teaching voice. There you go. Appreciate okay. that. All right. So. One of the things we want to do is ensure an inclusive environment, and this means a lot of things, um, but specifically one of our main goals is to ensure that accessibility is foremost a thought when creating online courses. This isn't only the right thing to do, it's also the law. So there are universities all over the United States that pay million dollar fines because the courses are not accessible, the online courses are not accessible. So what we do is we have a team, an accessibility and compliance team that reviews all online courses to ensure that they are accessible to students uh, in order to make sure that our students get the best education, no matter what their, their challenge might be. Um, we also wanna be known for world-class online programs. And so one of the things that we've done is we've created a series of committees um, we have a committee that is comprised of faculty and associate deans, that's our advisory committee. We have undergraduate student advisory committees and we have graduate student advisory committees. It's really important that our users have, an, have input into what is going to be uh, delivered online and um, be able to share with us what's working and what's not working. Um, Ex encourage experimentation. As I told you before, we really want to have research driven practice. And so Dr. Tanya Heath is a, an educator that we brought in from Illinois and she and her team not only do accessibility and compliance, but they also do uh, research. One of the most exciting things I think that we're working on is a virtual reality um, educational uh, program it's really short, it's on genetics, it's mine, it's in my biology course, I still teach uh, contemporary biology online. And basically, if you have an Oculus Quest, you can put on the glasses and you become me, and I have a lab coat and you know it's in a lab, a real lab that we have over in the ESAT building and you put on the gloves and then you can manipulate um, uh, the DNA sequences for blood type. And you can throw those into a Punnett square and you can work those out. So this has taken us about two years. Uh, it's really tricky stuff, but uh, I think it might be a wave of the future. We've also uh, recorded me doing it so that anyone who does not have the Oculus Quest can watch someone else do it. And then I can also do it live with an audience. Uh, so there are three different modalities and we are going to measure the efficacy of this VR. My, it's in my module eight genetics module. That is the most challenging module for my students. And so again, uh, data shows that my students are the least successful um, at this particular uh, activity because it's on paper. And so we converted it to an interactive uh, VR and then we're going to see if that changes um, their, uh, their ability to be successful on this, this design. So it's the same exact Thing that they do with a pencil and paper, but now they're going to do it in 3D and virtual reality. And we're going to see if that makes a difference. So everything that we do is research driven. Um, and we want to make sure that we are, are only spending money on those things that research demonstrates have an effect. Um, high utility learning technologies that lead to better learning outcomes. Again, uh, this is uh, classroom support is now more than classroom support. It's also DSI tech. And so things like Zoom uh, and, and that, those are all under our uh, purview, trying to see um, you know, what we're using right now and what effects it has. Um, and then we also have what's called Project Proteus, which we work with ITSS on other internal products that we have to determine uh, their financial viability. You know, are we spending too much money on a particular piece of technology for the ROI? 
um, reach new students and learners. This is one of the most exciting things that we're doing right now is we have a program co uh, in collaboration with Coursera. Uh, many of you probably remember the BAAS program, the Bachelors of Applied Arts and Sciences. Um, it's now under New College. Um, and it had about a thousand students that came through it. And what it is is a return to school uh, initiative. So students that had stopped out maybe even 20 years ago, they can return to uh, UNT and they can obtain their bachelor's degree um, through this program. You know, you have to have a minimum of 45 credit hours to be eligible to participate. Uh, but it counts work credits and, and it, uh, we have an advisory team that works through um, all the different um, credits that come from different colleges from different states and then we create a plan for that student. So we do a lot of the heavy lifting that students who have stopped out are frustrated because when they try to return so many things don't count or they don't have any help in figuring out what does count or what doesn't count. Well, Coursera, is, as many of you know, it is a, a started out as a MOOC-based platform, but it has 72 million users currently, and it grows by leaps and bounds every day. Two years ago, it had 43 million users. Um, and we partnered with them in order to expand the BAAS program to make it more available to people around the world. So students stop out all over the place, not just in the DFW area. And so students apply to UNT, they have to meet the same criteria as every other UNT student. They have to have a minimum of 45 credit hours. And then we are creating the same courses that we offer on site, um, creating those online and offering them on the Coursera platform. It is a huge savings to students. Uh, we were able to market it at a flat fee tuition. As you know, tuition is mandated, but the fees are not mandated. Um, and so what we're able to do is charge them just the flat rate and then the revenues on the other side pay the fees. So students just always receive just it's the same amount every time. It doesn't matter if it's in the College of Science or in the College of Liberal Arts or, or in journalism or wherever it's at. Um, we have had, uh, we currently have about 300 students enrolled and we just started this a little over a year ago. And in December, we'll have our first set of, of graduates that will graduate the program, about 62 students. What I love about that is that 62 students that will have a bachelor's degree and you know a million dollar difference in salary possibly over their life, lifetime. These are often, if not always, um, first generation students. So every uh, one of their children is no longer first generation because they have a parent who, who completed the bachelor, bachelor's degree. So it's really, really life changing um, and, and I cannot wait to, to be there and hopefully in person and uh, watch the students um, who choose to come here and, and walk the stage. Um, because again, this is, these are not students that would have ever come to UNT. Um, they're almost always out of state, if not at least international. Um, reimagine the physical classroom, uh, Adam, Fine, Dr. Fine, uh, who's the VP, his research is actually in um, um, classroom modifications and specifically in media, using media in order to enhance learning. So we came up with what we call the CLAW classrooms. And these are um, very interactive classrooms where if you're a faculty member, you actually have to apply to teach in this room, you have to demonstrate what it is that you would teach that would need the technology that's in there. And this way we're not buying um, advanced technology for all kinds of spaces, but we have faculty that still want to lecture, which there's no harm in that, but why would we pay a million dollars for a classroom for a lecture? So if you apply and your uh, teaching fits the classroom, then you can register for that classroom and your students can go in there and you can use that space. So I think this, we got this off the ground right as COVID hit. So it's still um, on the ground, uh, but you know, as we transition back to campus, uh, this will be one of our major foci. Uh, Evidence-based faculty development. As you guys know, at UNT, we have a faculty success. Um, and, and I know many of you share um, uh, heart warm, warm, feelings and, and heartfelt feelings for Bertina, the passing of Bertina Combs. 
um, just ab absolutely devastating. Um, so we in CLEAR have a faculty dev group and we work very closely with, um, we worked very closely with Bertina, um, but what we do is the online side. And so faculty that teach online, also graduate students um, that um, are learning to teach online, we have a G-STEP program for them. And then we have what's called faculty first flight, which every new faculty member that comes in is eligible and they receive a professional development stipend if they go through our faculty first flight program, which is best practices in teaching online. And Dr. Thompson, we actually got a, a question from Jim wondering yeah. uh, more specifically what types of activities can go on in a CLAW classroom? Yes, uh, so, so Jim, you may remember um, over in the ESAT building, we have one already, um, that's the Sky Theater right where it's all around you and so but but at the current time the only people that use that are only physics right it's not open to anyone else for any other reason well music has a lot of need for that kind of thing um, and so we have some spaces that we've spent a lot of money on that we are trying to open up um, we have some spaces that work really well with group learning and there's a computer screen at each pod where students can do breakout and go do work. This works really well with computational um, type courses. Um, we have project-based instruction courses. So there are five levels. Uh, the, the level one is your traditional um, lecture classroom. And then level five is like the Sky Theater. And so each level, there's slightly more technology and it's more interactive with student-led experience. Does that help answer that? Okay. Um, we're still working on this one too, streamlining um, data to allow for shareable, consumable, and actionable um, information. As you guys may know or remember that, that data at UNT was very segmented um, and, and whoever held it held the power. Um, we're trying to, to kind of fight through that and share. Matter of fact, I just purchased a product called IntelliBoard that can harvest data from Canvas and faculty, member will, faculty members, advisors, associate deans can harvest the Canvas data to see what students are in trouble. You know, which, which ones, you know, as faculty, we would see a student, but then they would move on and we wouldn't have any idea if they did really well in the class before or if they didn't. Um, and whether they're going to do well in the next class. And so this is going to allow um, the end user to harvest that Canvas data that right now is not, is not you can't harvest. Um, we have lots of data that we bring in uh, to help us make informed decisions. Um, and we monitor that very closely. We have relationships with MZ and EAB. Uh, MZ is uh, graduate data and EAB is data on where the gaps are. Uh, in industry and in, in jobs, and so that we can make sure that we are um, helping students find, um, you know, preparing students for jobs that exist um, and that are and making sure that they have the marketable skills. And so we have invested in those um, um, companies and or software in order to make sure that we can make those informed decisions. And that's digital strategy and innovation. So um, Dr. Fine is always open to anybody that ever wants to, to chat, um, share his experience from, from Illinois and, you know, has really brought a lot of excitement uh, to uh, UNT and especially to our group. And um, I'm, I'm really excited to be working with him. It was, as you all know, at UNT, you know, you agree to one thing and then the next thing you know, you're wearing five hats. So, um, and, and he's the kind of guy that can talk you into the sixth hat. Uh, so really good at what he does, very knowledgeable, very application-based, um, very down to earth. And um, you know, it, it is because of his leadership that we were able to move 7,500 courses online in a week. So that a lot of universities had to close for longer periods of time and we did not because we were able to, to work through that together and, and make sure that all the classes were up and running um, right after spring break. So the next thing I want to do is I just want to show you the DSI Clear site, 
which is not a whole lot different. Uh, do I have it on this one? I think I have it on another one. Um, and, and I wanted to share with you some differences that we're doing in clear. Does that sound okay? Okay. So I created a course in uh, 2016, the Biology for Contemporary, Contemporary Biology online, and I worked with CLEAR, and uh, there were things I really liked and things that I, I didn't like, you know, as, as faculty, right? Those are, those are pretty easy for us to define. Um, and so when I had the opportunity, um, I implemented a change that I think uh, faculty are, are really enjoying and I'm, I'm hearing good things about now. Did I do the work? No. I have an extremely talented team um, of amazing individuals who, uh, you know, do all of the work, right? These are the folks and, and we've got new people coming on. We don't have their pictures yet. Um, uh, these are the folks that do all of the magic. So what I'm going to share with you, though, is a process that we've implemented. And one of the processes is called uh, Course in a Box. So what we did was uh, we took a, a, a template, a canvas shell, and we templated out three modules, the start here and three modules. And faculty can then plug in their material, and then they'll know that what it is that, you know, how headers are accessible, because we've already made the headers accessible. So if they just copy that third or fourth module and then make the fifth module all the way up to the 16th module, then the accessibility will be there, okay? So we tried to put in the template as many um, tricky parts. I, I remember asking Clear in 2016, how do I make this accessible? And they said, good luck. Um, when Adam came, he heard that a lot. And that's the reason why the very first department other than CLEAR that we created was the Accessibility and Compliance Department. So that group under CLEAR, um, that team under CLEAR um, actually reviews every single course to ensure that every course it meets the accessibility and compliance standards by law. So we got together as a team of instructional designers and production group and Tanya at that time, she was on her own. And we built this template and we also built a training course. And the provost supported us and the way it works is you have to take the training. It's about three hours, it's asynchronous. Um, and it walks you through all of the, the quality matters rubric of, of what's best practices and accessibility and compliance. If you get a 70% or better, then you get a what we call a CIB dev shell, a, a development shell for the course in a box, and it's templated, and you can begin building your course. You build the first four modules, and then it stops you, and you, you're required to submit it for what we call a provisional approval check. When I was creating my course, I got to the 16th module, 15th, really 16th being the final, and Clear reviewed it, and they said, you've made a mistake from module two through 15. And I had to correct it in every single module. So I, I said, let's not do that. Let, let's do a provisional check, see if the faculty member is on track or if they need amendments. If they only need a few amendments, we just send that and say, hey, you're good to go, keep building. If the amendments are major, there's some major accessibility issues, we schedule a consultation with our accessibility team so that the accessibility team can work directly with the faculty member in order to figure out how to make that accessible. Faculty member continues to build um, and then they submit it again for a final check uh, for approval. And so the, even chairs that, that still teach have been very um, pleased with this. It is an, it, it takes some of the guesswork out of it. Um, and we're then able to do a larger quantity of courses because we're not creating new designs for every course, but rather building upon a templated design. Um, we also have now we have development cycles and so you have to uh, sign up online in order to join a development cycle. We send out a course development agreement that outlines the milestones and if the milestones aren't met by a faculty member then that course is deferred. Um, but then everybody's in, in knowledgeable about it, the dean, the chair, the faculty member and clear 
we're all understanding that for whatever reason, the faculty member ran into some additional challenges and they aren't able to finish. And so we can move that um, course to a different uh, build cycle and help that faculty when they actually have more time um, or when whatever adversity has, has uh, you know, come in their way is out of their way. We still do uh, multimedia, multimedia development services. What we did was we created web, form those, web forms and there are certain things that we can do. So it's no longer uh, you come to us with an idea and we'll help you build it. It really is much more streamlined now on these are the things that we can do. And the reason why we did that is because we are getting requests of over 250 courses a term to be built for online. And at this point with our capacity, we really can only make about 85, though we take in 100. Um, and, and that's a lot of classes. Um, just for summer, um, this summer, we will be offering 795 online courses. That's not remote. Okay, that's online courses. Um, as, as many of you remember from when you were here, uh, online was just such a small portion and it, it's growing by leaps and bounds. And by this time next year, it will be 15% of the offerings um, will be online. And then we have consultation requests. Back in the day, you would just call somebody over in clear and, and, and I, I shut that down a little bit only because as you guys know, with faculty, we end up going, well, could you just do it for me? And, uh, you know, the instructional design consultant who is making a lot of money uh, for that job, not a lot compared to a lot of people, but you know what I'm saying? They're overpaid to, to help with your grade book. So the consultation then, we can find out what it is you really need. And if you need help with your grade book, we can send that to the faculty help desk uh, because that's what they, they can do. Um, and then that way we're making sure the instructional designers where their talents are is in design, it's in quality matters, it's in best practices of online um, course delivery and design, then they're consulting with you about those things. Same thing for accessibility. We have a consultation form. Um, everything is closed right now because we're finishing up our fall cohort. I'm building that group of 100 courses that we'll be um, building for fall delivery. So we just kind of made it a little bit easier to shop um, in CLEAR. You're, you're not dependent on one IDC. One IDC is not assigned to a particular college or department. Um, all IDCs work on all courses. We also are required, and this was it started in 2016, but was kicked, the can was kicked until 2019. Um, there is a, a policy, a provost policy that was signed by Faculty Senate uh, 06030 that says all courses must be reviewed every three years. And so we're also responsible for reviewing courses to ensure that they are staying um, along with quality matters, staying in line with quality matters, accessibility and compliance. We currently do have a couple of pending cases um, where old courses were out of compliance and students have sued. Uh, this is the way the world is right now. And I don't blame the students. I don't, this is their right. They have the right to do that. Um, and so it becomes even more important than that we, we ensure that every course is accessible and we teach the faculty on how to, to make the courses accessible um, and that we provide those opportunities inclusively to all students. And that's about it, folks. Well, we really appreciate um, all that information. And um, as I mentioned earlier, you all have the ability to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question. I see Diana had one that she just put into the chat. NSF I test supports K through 12 education. Is there an equivalent for HE? I don't know if Diana might need to spell out some of those acronyms. I, maybe you know, Dr. Thompson. I, I do know what NSF I test is. Okay. Um, yeah. And we are governed by the THECB, Diana, the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, um, as well as SACS. And so the Texas Higher Education, um, Texas Higher Education Board, THECB, is in charge of dictating what is an online course, uh, what is a hybrid course. We, we use those terms a lot, though um, they're different than what THECB says. And so we really follow their guidelines. And then, of course, SACS with the 1818 in any content area, 
Um, and then Quality Matters, which is an UPSIA. Uh, it's sort of a universal um, online uh, metric for uh, what constitutes quality online programming. Um, and, and every university uh, is a member that wants to be, is a member of, of UPSIA. It's a great governing body and to ensure that we're all meeting very high standards. Uh, Rudy, I got a ton of questions. Is that all right? Okay, you betcha. That's my favorite. Uh, first off, uh, I used Clear a lot. They were in the PEB when I was there, so I could yes. walk down the hall and talk with them. Right. And uh, by the time I retired, I had either made a hybrid course, and I got some of those Clear awards to help do that kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, then I flipped the class totally. So they came to class once a week and did everything else online. So yep. I, I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun creating those new things. But uh, when I would go to those sessions, there'd be a number of people who all they would do was they would take a picture of the, a textbook or they'd have text up there. And so the student, and it was, I would use the word dynamic. It wasn't dynamic. It wasn't engaging. Uh, so when you switched this and went to 7,000 classes or whatever it was overnight, how engaging were those things? Were the faculty saying, oh yeah, this is gonna be fun? Or were they going, oh no, how in the world am I gonna do this? The answer is B. <laughs> um, we were able to not close the university by moving 7,700 courses to an online format. We were not able to check the quality of those. Uh, so we actually, the state allowed us to use a different designation, which was remote. No. Um, and so that's how we're able to keep separate. And so a remote course, because that was only created due to, due, due to the pandemic, it didn't have to meet the same requirements as an online course. Oh, okay. um, now the remote designation will be over in summer. And so we have faculty now they're like, well, if you just re review my remote course, I'm sure it will. And it does not, right? It's yeah. exactly what you're saying. Um, they just take pictures of textbooks, which is actually a, against the law. It's, it's, it's a copyright issue. Oh, good point, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, other thing, you, you kept mentioning uh, accessibility and compliance. Uh, does everyone then have to make sure that they're, does someone check those? Does the yes. color have to match the background, the size of the font? Is it all closed caption? You have to have everything like that on every course? Yes. Whoa, that's going to be tough. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I am so glad that we have Dr. Heap. Uh, we also have a lawyer, um, who John Simone, who does our copyright compliance. He's a copyright lawyer. So it's really excellent that he didn't want to do litigation, that, that this was, he's very happy in what he's doing. And, and he's also able to educate folks on, on like myself, on <laughs> what you can and can't do. Um, and we've hired uh, two full-time digital accessibility specialists, and we're about to hire a third. Uh, so that we can review all courses. Um, and when we built the template, it has the fonts and the colors. So we can say to faculty, if you just stick with this, you don't need to worry. But if you change it, then here's some things that you need to know. So most faculty are like, I'll just stick with a template, right? Because then I don't have to um, mm -hmm. worry about whether that font will be read by a screen reader or whether that color is something that a screen reader can, can do. The closed captioning is the hardest part. So we have three ways to deal um, with that. If, first of all, we recommend all courses are compliant, are accessible from the get, right? They, they meet compliance, which means accessibility and copyright. Um, if you can't do that, the second option is to uh, leave that um, piece of media in there, but not require it. Okay, if you don't require it, then it doesn't have to be closed captioned. Oh, it's okay. when you require the information for an exam or for an assignment that it has to be. And then the third option is to do an alternate assignment. So for instance, in my class, I have four activities that people built that are online that are free that my sighted students really enjoy of which I have 99%. This semester, I actually have four um, blind students. It's the largest number I've ever had in one term. I have 250 students in my class. Um, and, and so I just, what I do is I have an alternate activity for those students so that I can still require the other. Okay, so you always have three options as a faculty member. You can make sure it's all compliant from the get. 
You can uh, make those things that are not compliant, like videos or assignments, you can make those non-graded. Um, or you can leave those in there, but have an alternate. And the way the law reads is you have to have the alternate within at least three weeks of the assignment. So what we require is that the alternate is built up front and it's submitted along with the course. So I have four alternate assignments that I submitted along with my course for review because that way the accessibility team can make sure that the alternate assignment is actually meeting the needs, meeting the accessibility needs. If you try to fit it in that three week window, we might not have time to work with you. And so we do have some faculty that are like, oh, I'll just wait, you know, and then we do have some lawsuits. So we're really trying to encourage, you know, the opposite, those three, those three things, right? You can make those option or choose one of those upfront for your course. Um, I think the second thing that makes it really hard, Jim, is that a lot of faculty uh, then make significant changes within, let's say, eight months, or they change the textbook. And they mm -hmm. don't really understand then that the course is no longer accessible. Um, and so we're still dealing with that issue. You know, our recommendation is to, to try to hang on to that textbook for three years, because when you built the course, we made sure that every piece of material, including the text that you're using, is accessible. Okay. So right, last question for me, and I'll be quiet. Um, whenever I would think about a, a largely online university, I won't name it, but it comes out of Phoenix. Yes. I often wondered how, what the quality of those online things were. Is there a way that, that we could get access to just one lecture that's really dynamic that we could kind of see what goes on? Yeah, yeah, I can probably do that. Let me look into that. I can ask the faculty okay. member. Um, so the difference is, is that we, uh, University of Phoenix hires um, individuals to write courses, but they may not be experts in that field. We don't do that. So that's called a PCO model where you own all the faculty that do all of the writing and there may only be 10 people and they do every subject, mm -hmm. okay? We, Jim, if it was your course, we get you to write it, right? So it's your course, you have ownership of it, you're the knowledge, you're the expert, um, and when students have questions, they come to you just like they would in a face-to-face -face class. So that's really the big difference between, you know, New Hampshire and Phoenix and all of those. Yeah, they one. use, you know, a lot of master students, not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, but, you know, we're a, a research one university. And so one of the draws is you get to learn from our research one faculty. Thank you. You bet. Are there any additional questions from anyone? So, Ruthann, do you, uh, I had several blind students in my classes, which were uh, cla in classroom settings, yes. but I don't recall having any on online courses. So how do you accommodate the course in general? Other, I can, how do you do that? I mean, you mentioned captions, but what about reading material? How does that work? That's an excellent question, and I've learned a lot. And thank goodness we have, you know, Dr. Heath, um, who can teach us. So um, PDFs are not accessible. Screen readers can't read those. And so one of the things that we teach faculty is don't PDF stuff. You know, for some reason we'll like PDF a PowerPoint or we'll PDF a Word document. I'm not sure exactly why, but it's really best to just write right in Canvas, just write right on the screen. Um, because what happens is, is when a screen reader reads the PDF, PDFs are like JPEGs, they're pictures. And so it's just going to say picture, 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 and none of the words come out as words. I didn't know that, you know, without the, an expert um, sharing those kinds of things with us, we wouldn't know. So a lot of what's going on right now is absolutely in the form of education of our faculty. Uh, Tanya's created a... Um, a bridge training on how to make your course accessible. And we, those are most of our questions. Um, and they were my, my questions when I started writing online courses in 2016. So it, it can be done. The courses are absolutely phenomenal, um, but none of us are experts in that area, including ODA. ODA is not an expert in online media. Um, and so having that, that group is absolutely essential. Um, for our success. So you set up a consultation with Tanya. That's the answer. 
and then she'll walk you through exactly what's going on in your course, what's accessible, what's not, and then what you can do to make changes. All right, any, any more questions? I'm just really impressed. It's, it's really amazing that what you're doing there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and I would, if I uh, were still there, I would be very excited about all these experts and new developments. And uh, it would solve a lot of the issues that I had developing online courses personally, but also as a department or as a program when we were trying to develop courses that, uh, you know, that several people taught. <laughs> there were a lot of issues, as you know. <laughs> There's still issues I hear <laughs> from my friends. <laughs> um, and, and I don't know how to answer those quite yet. You know, so yep. if you have any advice for me, um, please send it my way. <laughs> okay, so uh, do, getting away with the doing away with the absent-minded professor syndrome might help. <laughs> that would help. Um, but I I have someone who's talked about this issue who might have some ideas. Actually, she's she's in charge of it. <laughs> well, that would be great. program. Okay, I'll we were try. Able to, so for instance, in chemistry, we have there are two factions in chemistry. There's atoms first and atoms last. So what I was able to show them is it's the same modules, you just put them in a different sequence. So we were able to build one course, but they could teach it in whatever sequence they want. Um, so there are sometimes ways that we can find compromises for faculty. Uh, there are sometimes that that are some of our faculty don't play well with others and they want their separate course. Um, and we try to accommodate that. But again, we've got hundreds of courses being requested. And so if we've already built your department one, it's tough to then build you a second one in front of all of these other people who, who don't even have one. So I, yeah, any answer I could get with that. I do meet weekly with a group of uh, 19 other colleagues at, at 19 other universities. And none of us have, have found a solution for that yet. Um, I, I don't know. trying to systemize it and we're trying to make it so much easier for faculty to understand what you're doing, what you're asking for, the amount of work that it's going to take. Um, you know, we really don't, Jim, have money anymore to pay faculty to develop online courses. And back in the day, if you developed an online course, you could actually make money off of it. That's all gone. Um, that was actually never legal. Um, and so, you know, it's a different world when you're working with faculty who are not getting paid and uh, that it has to be that they want that course to be online. Otherwise, it's just not going to make. All right. Well, Dr. Thompson, we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. This was very interesting. Even as a former student, I learned a lot of things about uh, how much things have changed since I was in class. And um, on it. yeah, if there are not any other additional questions, we go ahead and, and wrap it up for today. And um, as, as Dr. Thompson mentioned, um, you should have seen hopefully in our latest email, the YouTube link for the uh, celebration of life for Dr. Combs. Um, so um, you can check your email for that, which is gonna be at one o'clock. So just after lunch today. Um, and, uh, but other than that, we hope that everybody has a, a good afternoon. Any oh, final comments? Okay. I have a question, Jordan. Will that YouTube video be available later after one o'clock? I don't know. I, I assume so. I don't, I'm not sure why it wouldn't be. Um, and usually on that same link after the event, I think you should still okay. be able to access it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ruthann. Thanks, Thanks Rudy. Bye-bye. Right. Right. See you. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Jordan. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Thanks, Rudy. Betcha. Bye.